thank you for that introduction, and thank you to our hosts, um, Michael and Jonathan, and thank you to the Botschtiller Institute and University of Innsbruck. Um, this work is part of a larger sort of, you know, work that I'm writing on depictions of the other in Habsburg performance culture. So already, thank you to, to everyone here because I've had some great enlightening conversations and new, new ideas. Wearing a colorful heather, feathered headpiece and plumed kilt combined with a Roman style breastplate and cape, the personification of America entered the stage of the Teatro after Cortina in Vienna in 1668. The figure would have had to walk through the thin painted wings, which at this moment depicted 10 golden statues of ancestral Habsburgs on horseback. This America figure was not alone, but accompanied by other actors meant to represent the kingdoms of Bohemia and Hungary, the Holy Roman Empire, Italy, Spain, and Sardinia. These were the lands which the Habsburgs had political or dynastic ties to. What we can surmise from the surviving contemporaneously colored engravings by Matthias Kussel after the designs by Ludovico Ottavio Borgoncini is that the actor or singer playing America donned some type of black face makeup or wore a mask in dark brown fabric over their skin. It is also not outside the realm of possibility that someone at court of African descent was told to play the part of America. This single figure of America, dwarfed by the rest of the spectacle on stage and given only a few lines of text, can still tell us a lot about what the Habsburg court understood or failed to understand about Hunger Indians and how those views changed over time. In contrast to the static golden statues of past Habsburgs painted onto the flat scenographic elements, America was a living speaking figure, a figure that represented a myriad of influences, perceptions, precedents, and beliefs. The performance was of Il Pomodoro, an epic opera performed over two days at the Habsburg Court in Vienna in 1668. The allegorical personification of America is seen during the prologue titled Teatro della Gloria Austriaca, which was one bookend framing the mythological narrative of the opera in a way that reminded audience members where power and control lay. By the second half of the 17th century, allegorical personifications of America in visual culture across the Habsburg lands were nothing new, and like the prologue for Le Pomodoro, they were most often a small part of a more complex scene or visual cycle. Once Europeans encountered what they termed the new world, European artists hastened to create and propagate a visual image of it. As Sharika Davies explains, quote, devising allegorical personifications of the continents was the next step in emblematizing peoples of the world for mnemonic purposes, end quote. A set of questions were raised surrounding the perceived civility and genealogy of Amer Indians, which were often answered through visual depictions. In Vienna, the image of the Amer Indian was based almost entirely on secondhand sources, which included illustrated travel accounts, costume books, and images of festivities from the Spanish Habsburg lands. Only rarely were artists able to consult actual Amerindian artifacts from, uh, which were entirely disconnected from their original context. What we can certainly ascertain is that the images of Amerindians circulating across Europe and in Vienna were few, and those few were repeated and injected with large doses of imagination. One of the first depictions of Amerindians commissioned by a major Habsburg ruler can be found within the more than 130 woodcuts making up the triumphal procession of Maximilian I. I think we saw one of these the other day. The work was intended to depict all peoples of the known world processing in honor and obedience to Maximilian. Although not intended as a design for an actual event, the triumph was more so a massively inflated and idealized festive procession based on real examples which were becoming more common in court culture at this time. The triumph, first conceived by the emperor himself and mainly executed by Hans Bokmeyer between 1516 and 1518, and then not fully published until 1526, includes three plates of the people of Calicut. As Christian Feast explains, quote, the term Calicutish is derived from the old designation Calicut for the present cozy code in the Indian federal state of Kerala, the city which Vasco da Gama had landed in 1498, end quote. In German sources, around the end of the 15th through the early 16th century, the term was simply used to refer to an array of different far-off peoples. At this time, it was still a common belief that what was deemed the New World could be reached westward by sea or eastward by land. The depiction of the Calicut exemplified this European overlapping of the Asian continent with the Americas. As Feast further explains and elaborates, the Calicut, as depicted in the triumph, are a visual mixture of peoples from Asia, Africa, and the Americas. 
The physiognomy of many of the figures can be traced to some of Bookmeyer's other work depicting Africans, while some of the objects they hold are drawn after objects from the Tupinamba people of Brazil, of modern day Brazil. Their feather crowns and skirts are also of Brazilian origin, while in plate 129, the, the first one there, the leader of the Calicut rides an elephant and wears a turban. So the Calicut, through the mixing of entirely different non-European peoples, were enough to demonstrate that Maximilian was aware of the new world and was a player in buying for its riches. In Vienna, the first documented use of a reference to the new world in festival culture can be traced to celebrations for Emperor Maximilian II in 1563, upon his entry into the city after being crowned Holy Roman Emperor in Frankfurt. Three triumphal arches built from wood and covered with painted fabric were erected in the city center along the procession route. On one triumphal archway, directly above the arch itself, two winged figures hold small laurel wreaths, within which are the words de Sarcenis and de Indis, alluding to the Habsburg victories both over the Ottomans and the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Another arch for the same triumphal entry evokes the exotic, with the inclusion of a rhinoceros and elephant on the dados. Just a few decades before, as we've seen with the leader of the Calicut in Maximilian's triumph, he rides an elephant, furthering the connections between Amerindians, elephants, and a land connection via Asia. Many more examples of allegorical American figures can be found in triumphal arches erected in Habsburg lands after 1563, but for the sake of time, let's return to the American figure from El Pomodoro of 1668. He is not part of a triumphal devotional procession, such as that from Maximilian's triumphs, where the subjugated are made clear of their captivity and order in line. Bordicini's allegorical figure of America for El Pomodoro flips the situation and depicts the Amerindian mother as a heroic Romanized hero in classical contrapposto. However, in this Roman Europeanization and domestication, he is still under a form of captivity, perhaps a more striking and dangerous one due to its less obvious nature. He is not in physical chains, but is completely assimilated, denied of his context, voice, and meaning. As Stephen Mullaney writes, figures representing the new world, such as this one, quote, were incorporated into existing structures of festivity as but one of a number of more familiar examples. That is to say, their inclusion altered neither the structure of whatever ritual or celebration they were part of, nor the structures of perception of those who witnessed them. Ludovico Ottavio Bonaccini, the imperial court architect and stage designer, as his official title read, and the artist of the America figure, left us with even more curious examples of how festive court culture in Vienna understood or failed to understand the Upper Indian. Bordicini arrived in Vienna with his father, a theater architect, in 1651 in Venice. In a way that is unique to his origins, experiences, and artistic inclinations, Bordicini brought together many influences, including Commedia dell'arte and Venetian stage practices. What we have to keep in mind when observing his works is the role of a theater artist and the expectations placed upon them by the patrons. Above all, Bernicini's main concern as creator of imperial, imperial spectacles was to impress and entertain. By including foreign characters from far off lands, it merely demonstrated the geographical awareness of the court and linked it, however superficially, with ongoing developments in science exploration and colonization. Bernicini left behind 189 drawings making up his Mascara series, within which 10 sheets form a sub series titled Indiani. The majority of the loose, sheet, loose sheets in the Moscow series depict costumes, each page containing a male and a female figure. The drawings' extremely finished quality with little evidence of process work likely indicate they were made as a documentation of the costume inventory of the Hofburg. Andreas Nomarmontis has proposed that they likely could have served in addition to an album of the costume in inventory, also as prototypes for engravings intended for publication. The Indiani make up one group of 16 within the Moscow series, which addition additionally includes groups such as Romans, Persians, Turks, and Ethiopians. The costumes were made for the so-called Wirtschaften, celebrations of the court of Leopold I, where noble families, including the emperor and empress themselves, would dress up as people of lower classes or from other parts of the world. When looking through the Indiani drawings, the first thing that is immediately apparent is the light skin color of the figures, and that each figure is heavily clothed. The dark skin seen in the Il Pomodoro American figure is no longer present. Despite the frequent nakedness in many images of Amerindians, it would not have been appropriate to have nobles at court or actors scantily clothed. The necessity to entirely clothe his figures would have encouraged Bornicini to further 
use his imagination in the designs, multiplying and adding materials for repeating and extending patterns and smaller motifs over larger areas. It was not only nakedness that presented a problem, but the early modern era's understanding of the relationship between outward appearance and inner temperament. As William C. Sturtevant explains, Europeans understood clothing and bodily adornment to express social hierarchy and the social characteristics of people. Costume books underline this viewpoint through their display of isolated individual figures, which force the viewer to draw conclusions based on dress and appearance. Some theorists of the time even went so far as to propose swapping clothing to change one's social character. So Bornicini balanced on a pretty thin line. In these first two sheets of the Indiani series, we're already presented with an array of colors, patterns, and materials. The male figures wear heavy feather capes and feathered skirts. Their chests and waists overlaid with jewel bands. The proportions of the bands and shapes of the jewels lend an almost Byzantine element, alluding to Bornicini's free mixing of source material. Some of the headpieces share commonalities with images of the Ottoman rulers printed by Theodore de Clue in 1596. However, they're not direct copies. While some of Bornicini's other groups of figures from the entire Mascara series have somewhat of a more cohesive color palette, already within the first four Indiani costumes seen here, we have large areas of each red, blue, green, yellow, and white. Although Bornicini has not made one-to-one -one copies from costume books in his designs, as we find in some examples from other European court artists, you don't have time to get into all of them here, he no doubt was aware of them, of costume books. Among the earliest examples of costume books to include full figures representing America is Abraham de Brun's 1580, The Costumes of Various Nations of Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. One of the figures showing the dress of America, or on the figure showing the dress of America, are feathered kilts, hats, and a cape, similar to Bornachini's. Reinforcing the feathered cape and crown as an iconic look of all of the Americas, De Kloon uses these two items of apparel on the otherwise naked allegorical figure of America on the title page of his album. The figure also wears a jewel necklace, armband, feathered headpiece, and pearl earrings. At least one figure from Bornicini's series seems to wear pearl earrings. More obvious are the bows and arrows held by two of Bornicini's male figures, which are found in multiple of the unrelated figures in De Kloon. Bornicini and Dublin do not depict the flat bows found in some sources of honor Indians from North America. Even if Bornicini did not specifically observe Dublin's costume album, he almost certainly would have seen the figures copied in other costume books. Here we see Pietro, Pietro Bertelli's De Versaro Nazionale Habitus of 1589, which contains two of Dublin's figures as flipped copies. One of the most widely disseminated and popular costume, costume books Cesare Vecellio's Aviti Antichi includes Amerindians in his expanded 1598 version. Aviti Antichi made it into many subsequent reprintings, including one in 1664, just before Bornicini was designing Il Pomodoro and creating his Mascara series, included the Indiani forms. The largest and most detailed source for Europeans to understand the New World, however, appeared at the tail end of the large era, era of costume books. The 13 volume America series published by Theodore de Blue and his family beginning in 1590 combined previously published and unpublished travel reports on the Americas in Dutch, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and German. Part of the long term and lasting effect of the series was due to the quality and sheer number of the engravings paired with the reports. Also, as William C. Sturtevant tells us, that quote, research on all subsequent illustrations of American Indians must take de Blue into account where he served as an artist source for at least two centuries. In the depictions of the indigenous peoples of Florida, similarities can be seen in the headwear found in some of Bornicini's figures. In the tattooing and bodily ornaments, we can begin to observe where Bornicini might have been inspired. The tattooing on some of de Bruyne's figures is entirely false and shows a European damask pattern. Bornicini has also adopted similar patterns, one of which can be seen, seen here. Small hanging rounded elements in the Indiani are also present in De Blue's works. And I'm going fast through some of these. He also depicts the feathered capes and skirts found in many other sources and fantastically expanded upon by Bornicini. Bornicini also gives us a few rare instances of context, which don't happen, happen often in the entire series of the Moscow drawings. Um, in one drawing, a figure holds up jewels from a treasure box, evoking De Blue's depiction of Amerindians holding jewels in Columbus's arrival. 
Another of Bornicini's figures leans on large blocks of stone, which I consider vaguely reminiscent possibly of, of Mayan or Aztec pyramids. Despite the hand coloring of some of the Dublin engravings, we might next question the sources for Bornicini's colors, since obviously most of the Brusius was, was not um, published in color. Um, by Bornicini's time, many Wundung Kunstkammen included objects from the Americas, as we've discussed earlier. Earlier examples of such material culture have been observed and drawn by Albert Dürer and Hans Vogtmeier, and there certainly were documented examples in Viennese imperial collections. One major problem, however, is that the exact origins of such objects and when they enter the collections is, is rarely documented. Reputedly made from observation after Amerindians and Amerindian objects are the images in the Tochten book of Christoph Weidens. Elizabeth Hill Boone explains that despite the fact that they were only published in the 20th century, the paintings in Weidens' Tochten book were circulated and copied after they were made around 1530. We can clearly see the colored stripes of the feather capes adopted by Bornaccini, as well as the bottom hem and even the pose of one figure. It is also of note that Vidas most likely observed Aztecs and documented the brown skin of those he observed, something which could have influenced Bornaccini to either darken the skin of this America figure, or on the flip side, later realize that Amerindians did not have skin as dark as many Africans. Since there is only little evidence of Bornicini copying designs and motifs directly from costume books and illustrated travel accounts, a source that he no doubt was aware of was illustrations of festivals and performances from other courts and cities, especially the court of Paris and Versailles. Emperor Leopold I's major rival, artistic competitor, and not to mention first cousin, was Louis XIV of France. Both rulers, more so than any other two courts in Europe at the end of the 17th century and at the dawn of the 18th, tried to outdo one another through festive displays and costly performances, which signaled their dominance over the entire world through the inclusion of foreign characters. And this is here with Louis in his opera costume, I'm sorry, Leopold in his opera costume and Louis in his dance costume, so they're both wearing things that were, were designed for performances. Um, in 1662, Louis XIV put on his grand carousel, a spectacular display, the centerpiece of which was a parade of extravagant costume noblemen dressed up as groups of people from around the world. The costume designs are credited to Henri Jusse, and when precisely Bornicini might have seen the images or read about the carousel is hard to say, as the most famous illustrated account was not published until 1670 after El Pomodoro. There are no doubt reports shared between the different courts. However, the date falls right within the possible time frame of the, um, the creation of the Indiani drawings. The case for Bornicini being influenced by his French peers in the understanding, uh, sorry, in the understanding of Amerindians is supported by the notable differences between his America figure from the Pomodoro and then the slightly later Indiani series. The America figure is much closer in style to other allegorical personifications of America from the Spanish Habsburg lands and German-speaking territories, while the Indiani, most likely created after 1670, rely heavily on imagination and invention, just like their French counterparts. One notable, notable difference between Bornicini's work for the Habsburgs versus the French carousel is that the French work makes a clear distinction between Indians and Americans. Both form individual groups within their own iconography and placement within the overall structure of the carousel. Given the early French conquests in North America, this conscious differentiation between Indians and Americans makes sense for the French on a political and social um, cultural level. Um, Alvisha says designs for the carousel denote a clear color palette, differing, defining each group of the parading figures, something not so evident in Bornicini's work. However, we cannot simply fault Bornicini for a lack of cohesion in the designs when we consider the ways and spaces in which Bornicini's costumes were worn and seen. In the carousel, the parading figures were viewed across a vast outdoor space of the Louvre and the Tuileries, and for many viewers, the distinct color coding of each group would have been the only way to differentiate them. Bonaccini's costumes, on the other hand, worn at the imperial celebrations, would have been seen only up close and in smaller spaces. Uh, monotone color palettes would have actually diminished their impact in a setting where the details of each costume would have been really extremely distinguishable. This further highlights Bonaccini's desire to imbue the costumes with extravagant details and not to simply follow its distinguished precedents. The actual structure of the Wirtschaft and the celebrations and Bonaccini's costumes for them thus counter the way in which the other have been depicted as subjugated and captive in such grand processions as the carousel and Maximilian's triumphs. 
Instead of being last place in a linear processional approach during the Wirtschaften, it could appear as if Amerindians were one group mingling with the rest of the world. Because of the nonlinear structure of the events, because those observed were also those performing, the other had an odd form of agency, if we can call it that, the voice of a Viennese noble person. We see similar tendencies arise in the 18th century in such writings as Montague's Persian Letters and in operas such as Rameau's Les Angelins, where inhabiting the other becomes a guise under which Europeans could attempt to critique and criticize their own society. So the Wirtschaften had the possibility to act as almost like a Viennese precursor to this. And in conclusion, in the abandonment of an ethnographical approach and the adoption of a great amount of imagination, Bernaccini is arguably going beyond what existing publications and sources for telling Europeans about our Indians. Even if he is inaccurate in his portrayals, he is no longer merely propagating existing visual models, themselves most often based on stereotypes. Bernaccini is speculating and inventing a more visually complex Amerindian figure, and based on the European's emphasis on understanding people through their outward appearance and clothing, a figure which necessitated a deeper reading. Even the mere inclusion of the Amerindian and the Wirtschaften demonstrates that it formed a group of people in the Viennese consciousness that could no longer be ignored, overshadowed, or restricted only to the periphery as decorative, allegorical elements.